What's up everybody, I'm Matt Gary, and in this episode of Coding with the Force, we're gonna go over absolutely everything that you need to know about triggers in Salesforce. We'll go over what they are, when they fire, how to write them, uh, we'll do examples in Apex, we'll figure out what trigger handlers are, we'll figure out the most popular trigger handlers uh, around and when you should use one over the other, and we'll go over what domain classes are and how they differ from a trigger handler. So. A lot of stuff. We're gonna start basic and get up to the more advanced stuff. And by the end of it, my hope is you'll be a trigger expert in Salesforce. All right, guys. So today we are gonna go over absolutely everything that there is to know about triggers in Apex. Uh, Okay, we, we probably won't go out, uh, over absolutely everything because there's an enormous amount, but we're going to go over enough to where you are going to know everything that you need to know about triggers to write really great ones for your Salesforce instance. Um, we're going to start with figuring out what a trigger is. Obviously, that's what's on the screen in front of us. Um, but we're also going to figure out what a DML statement is, uh, how the order of operations work in Apex or order of execution. We'll figure out how to write a trigger together. Um, we will go over the unique trigger variables uh, within the context of a trigger operation. Uh, we're gonna go over trigger handlers, popular trigger handlers, and when you might use one over the other. Uh, these popular trigger handlers are these frameworks that exist out on GitHub for free uh, that you can use to make your life a little bit easier. And we're gonna go over a domain class uh, what it is and why you might use what's referred to as a domain class over a trigger handler. Now we're going to start off really simple and then we'll get to the more advanced stuff as this uh, you know, video progresses. So don't get freaked out by those bigger words or any of the words really that I've said uh, at this point because I'm going to make it real simple to follow. Uh, I promise. Okay? So just stick with me and we'll get through it all. And uh, by the end of it, Triggers will be like, no big deal, no big deal. All right, so first things first, what is a trigger and um, you know when does it run and when would you use one? Well, a trigger in Apex is basically, uh, it, and this isn't, by the way, just in Salesforce. Uh, th this is uh, true on other uh, platforms as well or uh, other tech stacks or whatever you wanna call them. Um, Triggers are things that will be invoked or they will run when you um, do typically a database uh, operation. So something like creating a record or inserting a record, updating a record in your system, deleting a record, um, undeleting a record, all those kinds of things. In fact, you can see them all uh, listed for in, in front of me, insert, update, delete, merge, upsert, undelete. Um, these are all events that can happen to a record like a contact record or an account record in your system that would then cause a trigger to fire. And when that trigger fires, you'd ideally want some code that you've written to run to, to kind of like automatically update these records uh, in ways that um, you don't want to have to bother a user with, right? You know, maybe you want to update a field on a contact automatically. Uh, you don't want to have to depend on a user to do that or, or something along those lines. You want to keep your, your uh, data nice and clean um, and based on however a user fills out a contact, you want to update some fields. Now, that might be a great use case for a trigger. I don't know. There's plenty of use cases for triggers. Um, so, again, just to break that down one more time, triggers are basically things uh, that you can use to automatically run code on database operations, inserting, updating, deleting, uh, undeleting, that kind of stuff. Now, um, the next thing that you uh, might want to know is, okay, so I have a trigger that can, uh, you know, do all this stuff. There's a lot of other things that can do things similar to a trigger, like flows, uh, process builders, which you really shouldn't use these days, workflows, same situation, probably shouldn't use those. 
etc etc um where when, when does the trigger fire uh when you update these things right maybe you don't maybe you don't even know about all those things yet but it's important that you know that um in salesforce when you insert a record or update it or whatever else there is an order of execution that happens and as it would happen uh triggers don't actually fire first uh flows fire first these days record triggered flows and then you have before triggers uh, validation rules uh, and some other uh, things uh, duplicate rules then it kind of saves it it saves it to the database but it doesn't commit it to the database yet your your record that you're updating and then it executes your after triggers and then a bunch of other things happen too like assignment rules auto response work rules workflow rules escalation rules uh, other flow automations uh, record triggered flows entitlement rules tons and tons of things happen so it's really important really really important I'm showing you this now because it's important that you know that all of these things happen when you do an update or an insert or whatever to your database um, and don't worry you know about this too much now but I just want to start you off with the fact that in Salesforce anyway when you do a database interaction like inserting or updating a record a trigger is not the only thing that fires tons of other things fire and they all fire in what's called the same execution context which we'll go over more later but the more of these things that you have you know if you have a bunch of record triggered flows and triggers and whatever else on the same object the slower things go and that's going to be important as we talk about things like trigger handlers and domains and stuff a little further in the future um, all that kind of stuff but it's really important that you know that all of these things happen and where triggers execute in this context so I'm gonna put this in the description of this video so you have this as a reference and it's really really important you know uh, you might be hitting limits uh, when you insert or update things and you think maybe that's caused by my trigger that I wrote and maybe it is uh, but it could also be because of these many other things that happen in the context of your you know database operation your insert your upsert uh, update whatever okay so we know what triggers are we kind of have an idea of what the order of execution is in apex we've got record triggered flows before triggers validation rules duplicate rules um, after triggers assignment rules auto response rules etc 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 lots of stuff now <clears throat> the question is when should you use uh, the next question I think most people have is when should you use a trigger over a flow and um, everyone has a little bit different opinion on this matter personally I just prefer triggers and I will explain why here in a moment um, but I will tell you good use cases for flows and good use cases for triggers if you're in a smaller org like a really small org I'm talking like 500 users or less and you don't ever think it's gonna grow any bigger than that using a flow is probably not gonna be a big deal like ever so go on ahead and use the flow if that's what you're more comfortable with because you have an admin background and not a developer background that said there are situations that are so complex that flows really can't handle them without apex anyway and in the instance that you need apex to deal with a record trigger flow i would just suggest making a trigger as soon as you get a record trigger flow to the point where you have to use invocable apex anyway because the flow can't really do what you want it to do don't make the record triggered flow just make a before trigger or sorry a, a trigger um, and um, you know that that's that's my take on it anyway you, you will probably get into situations and basically instantly know you know it's uh, at a certain point in your career anyway instantly know when you should use one over the other but 
smaller orgs flows are good for. Bigger orgs, they really start to break down um, because of the limits that are invoked, uh, you know, that are set on flows that aren't on triggers. And, you know, if you have to use Apex in a flow, just use a trigger. It just, it, it's just silly combining them when you have an alternative option in my, in my opinion. Now everybody's gonna have different opinions and I really welcome them. Uh, I, I am not opposed to learning new things or having opinions differ from my own. I really do appreciate it. Uh, but that's really my take on it. Smaller companies use flows. Really, 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 really simple things uh, use the flows. Larger companies, I really would not hardly ever suggest a flow because of my, uh, uh, my huge amount of experience with flows and in larger companies. I just don't suggest them. They can really get you in a jam that you, you can't uh, easily get out of. So uh, bigger companies use triggers. Smaller companies use flows. Um, but if you ever have a situation where a flow can't handle it and you need Apex, just write it as a trigger. Don't, don't try and combine the two technologies, in my opinion. In this particular instance, it's not worth it. That's not, I'm not saying that about all flows, but for record triggered flows, I think that's true. Okay, so now that we've got that over, when should you use a record triggered flow and when should you use a trigger? Hopefully that was kind of clear. Let's get into this whole concept of a before trigger and an after trigger and uh, maybe write a trigger together. Um, there's a lot of other things before I get into that uh, that you should know about triggers. And we are gonna go over some of them like bulkifying a trigger and the trigger syntax and trigger context variables together here in just a little bit. But there are other things that I'm not gonna go over because it's just, they're just really uh, crazy edge cases that you're gonna rarely get yourself into. So I'm going to link you to these docs in the comment, or sorry, in the description of this video, and you can go check them out there's lots of really interesting things in here that you should uh, know about, like operations, the unique operations that don't invoke triggers, um, you know, how triggers work, work with merge statements and recovered records and all that kind of stuff. Uh, these are things that aren't super important that I go over in this video, but they are important that you just know where to go look at these things when the triggers are acting in a weird way way so this uh, all this stuff will be in the uh, description of the video and you can check this out and read some more about it if you'd like and we're gonna go over plenty of this just not all of it I want to make that super clear all right so um, what is the difference between a before and an after trigger this is a really confusing concept to a lot of people I think because uh, it's a little bit, um, you know, I guess unique of a situation, but we're gonna go over it a little bit together. So as you can see, actually, before I write this quote code, it states here that it executes all before, uh, sorry, in the order of execution here, it states that all before triggers are run, then validations and duplicate rules, then it saves the record to the database, but doesn't commit it yet. And then it executes all after triggers, right? So the important thing to know is this record doesn't exist really in the system yet in the before context. And in the after context of a trigger, it does exist in the system, but we haven't officially said, keep this in the database and don't get rid of it, right? More or less. That's it's kind of what it means by it hasn't committed it yet. That's a very simplified version of it, it hasn't committed it. We've got it in the database. It's there. Uh, we want to keep it, but we're not 100% sure it's going to make it through all the other junk yet, so we haven't committed it at this point. Before trigger, that's not true. It's not in the database yet. It's just a theoretical record that might end up there. You know, we'll see. Um, all right, so let's kind of go over some unique things about a <clears throat> about before triggers and about after triggers. And we'll do so by finally creating a trigger together. So let's do that. Um, I am using IntelliJ here and Illuminated Cloud 2. If you have no idea what 
this is or what an IDE is or anything like that, don't worry. I have videos on all of them and I'm going to link the playlist up in the corner here and you can check that out. You can figure out what an IDE is. You can figure out how to set up IntelliJ and Illuminated Cloud 2 or you can figure out how to use VS Code. Doesn't matter which one you choose. It's all the same. So now we're going to create a trigger together. And I'm going to show you how to create a trigger in both Visual Studio Code and in IntelliJ, just in case there are people out there that are uh, not super familiar with anything at all yet, right? So in Visual, uh, sorry, in um, uh, <laughs> IntelliJ and Illuminated Cloud 2, if you want to create a trigger, you just right click on this triggers, uh, you know, folder here. Um, and you will create a new Apex trigger, like so. And you'll name it whatever you want to name it. I'm going to create a contact trigger, so I'm going to name it contact trigger. And um, we'll find the contact object down here somewhere, maybe. There we go. And uh, I'm just going to click on you know what operations I wanted to do. I'm going to click on all of them just so I can show you all of them and uh, explain them. And I'll zoom in here. And if I'm doing this in Visual Studio Code, just in case you're super unfamiliar with Visual Studio Code right now, uh, you would do Control Shift P to bring up the command palette here. And you would say uh, trigger and that SFDX create Apex trigger. Name it whatever you want to name it. We can name it contact trigger again, just like before. Put it in the directory that you'd like to put it in. Right, it's going to ask you about that. Click there, and it'll set it up just as uh, before. Now, the difference between uh, Illuminated Code and uh, Visual Studio is that, as you can see here, in, in uh, Illuminated Code, it actually put it on the correct object, this contact object, which I'm going to go over all of this syntax in just a minute. But in Visual Studio, it doesn't. It just says S object, and you've got to change this, right? I mean, if you've done enough triggers, it's no big deal. But if it's your first time, it's a little confusing. So we know that we want this to be on the contact object, so we'll just say on contact, like so. Um, so that's what you need to know about uh, Visual Studio. Um, outside of those two things, you know, how we create a trigger in Visual Studio and the fact that you need to you know, right in your object. Everything else I'm going to show you that's in uh, IntelliJ is all the same, especially if you follow my IDE setup for Visual Studio Code, right? Nothing's, no, nothing else I'm going to do is, is going to change at all. So, um, okay, let's get back on over here to IntelliJ and we'll keep on keeping on. Um, so we've created a trigger that we have named contact trigger, and we have placed this trigger on the contact object. So what this means is when a, an insert or an update or whatever happens on the contact object, this trigger would fire. And we tell this trigger what specific operations on the contact object we want it to work on. So right now we actually have it on every single one, but as you can see, you have to declare each and every one of them. You have to declare before insert, before update, before delete, after insert, after update, after delete, and after undelete. And you might be asking, well, why isn't there a before undelete? Well, there's no before in that context. You know, it's just you've undeleted it, and now it's a record again. And after the fact that it's a record, you can do things. It's a little bit confusing. Uh, you can read more about undeletes and their weirdness. Uh, you know, in that in that uh, trigger documentation in the description of this video, there are very few situations in when you uh, in which you would use an after on delete, but it's good to know that they exist. So if you deleted a record and you undelete it and you wanted something to automatically happen because of that, you can do that in a lot of situations. All right, in my instance, all I'm going to care about uh, for this trigger that we're going to write together. <clears throat> is the before insert and the after uh, insert. So I'm going to delete all the rest of this because I do not want my trigger to run on any of those other executions. And it would be a waste to have it run in any of those other um, you know, situations where my record is updated or, or 
you know, deleted or whatever. So you, again, to write a trigger, you declare it as trigger, not a class, like most Apex. Uh, you, you don't write it as a class. You write it as a trigger. So it's a trigger. Uh, and then you name it. You tell it what object it's going to be on. And then most important, well, actually really also important, you tell it what operations on that object you would like this trigger to run on, right? If you don't put these here, your trigger's not going to run. And then you'll be confused and sad, and we don't want that. So don't forget to uh, add all those operations in here that you want it to run on. But don't add more than you want it to run on. That will slow down executions for no reason. So, you know, just put what you want, what you actually need. <laughs> okay, so another thing that I want to talk about, so we've, we've set up this trigger. Uh, there's nothing here yet. We're going to go over more of it in just a minute. Um, but um, one thing I want to make very clear before we get too far in to this video and, you know, you maybe get bored or whatever, or you, you get lost. We're going to go over more of this situation that I'm about to show you when we get into trigger handlers and domain classes way later down the road. But I just want to make this very clear up front for those people that aren't going to watch the trigger handler stuff but still need to absolutely know this. Um, you can make methods in a trigger, right? That can be done. Uh, but it's important to know one thing, and we'll figure that out together. So let's say you wanted to make a method in your trigger, which is great. You know, you want to make a method, that's a good thing, typically, most of the time. So we'll just make one together. And we'll call it, I will say, public static void, uh, I don't know, cool method. <clears throat> and that's it, right? And maybe uh, we'll put a system debug. Um, this method was called like so, right? Wonderful. Well, um, if I wanted to call this method for one reason or another to reuse this functionality somewhere else in my Apex code, which is a very common thing, you can't do that. There's no way to do that. So if I went to my execute anonymous window um, and I said, uh, you know, I don't know, new contact trigger dot pool method and tried to run it like if I was uh, in a regular Apex class. It's not going to let me do that because you can't initialize a trigger. And so you can't run the methods within that trigger from outside of the trigger. So anything else that you theoretically wanted to run this code that it could be useful for can't run it, which is a big reason why people will constantly tell you in triggers you should not ever write any code <laughs> and we'll get to that when we get to the uh, trigger handler stuff and the domain class stuff but just know this is a huge deal it makes it hard to test your code in a trigger it makes it hard to um, you know do a, do a lot of stuff so <clears throat> reuse your code all, all that so we're gonna code some stuff together here in this trigger uh, without using a trigger handler and all that kind of stuff so that you can go over the concepts that are important to understand in a trigger but I want to make it very clear super clear before we start what I'm about to show you you should never do you should use a trigger handler framework um, and uh, or a domain class to write your code in and we're gonna go over that way later but before we get into any of this, I want to make that clear because I don't want you to end this, you know, wherever you end it after you think you learned enough and think, you know, let's write all my stuff in a trigger. <clears throat> okay, so cool. I'm setting you up here. Uh, we'll get back to this later, but uh, let's get to it. So unlike, um, I guess, uh, a regular Apex class, I can basically just write whatever code I want to directly in the trigger. I don't have to have a method, uh, whatever else. You know, in a normal Apex class, I can basically just declare variables up at the top, and that's base and that's pretty much it. But here in a trigger, I can say, you know, if uh, trigger dot new, uh, I don't know, is not equal to null or something, 
then you know do something system dot debug this ran yay and then I can also you know call cool method or something along those lines right and so in a normal apex class I can't do this right I can't just write some code up at the top of my class but in a trigger I can and that's because as we've already seen triggers are super different than apex classes even though they look exactly the same and you're technically still writing code um, this doesn't quite operate like an apex class you can't make a new instance of a trigger uh, you can write code wherever you want to in the trigger uh, it's just a different entity and you need to know about these different things so um, now I've got this trigger and I can run it and I'm going to run it just so that you can see what happens you know that, that this stuff does run in just a second and, and then we're gonna go over these uh, trigger context variables like trigger.new, trigger.old, blah, 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 and figure out what they are and when to use them and why they're useful. So um, let's do that. I've got my org open, and I'm actually on the contacts tab. That's kind of surprising. And I'm going to just create a new contact. And uh, to make it a little bit easier for your viewing pleasure, I guess, <laughs> I don't know that I want to use that word, but uh, I'm just going to open up the dev console so that we can view the logs because I think it's a little easier to look at. Um, okay, so I'm going to create a brand new contact and we'll call it uh, Mr. Cool Cat. Uh, and I think that's all I need, but we'll see. Uh, storage limit exceeded. Now that one is interesting. Well, that's okay. I uh, guess I've used this org to teach things too much, and I need to go delete stuff. But we will just uh, change this for now and make this trigger operate on before update and after update, and we'll just update some contacts. All right. Okay, so we'll go to this uh, contact here, Jambet. And we will um, just update something about Jambet. Doesn't really matter. Can be anything, literally anything, or nothing. As long as I hit the save button here, the trigger will run, which is important. You don't have to do anything to your contact, uh, really, for it to run my trigger. So why don't we just do that? We're just going to edit it and save and change nothing at all. And um, <clears throat> over here, I hope. The trigger ran and it did and you can see that so it says this ran yeah this method was called this ran yeah this method was called and you might be looking at this right now and saying what on earth why did this run two times right why did this get run two times and output two times and uh, the short answer to that is because we have it on before and after update. And in the before update call, it's going to run this because there's nothing stopping it from not running it in before uh, update. And in the after update call, it's also going to run this because, you know, again, there's nothing stopping it from running it there. So these things are going to be run twice. And that's really, really important to know because there's a lot of operations that you probably only want to run on update, right? or sorry on the before portion of your update there's a lot of things that you maybe want to run only on your after update portion and if you have your trigger running on both and you don't have anything preventing that from occurring well then it's gonna run it both times so um, we've got to figure out how we can deal with that and again trigger handlers and domains are gonna make this a little bit simpler to mess with but let's figure out how to do that together by using these wonderful trigger context variables and going over them so let's pull this triggers documentation up and we will go to trigger context variables and uh, there's a lot of them and most of these I'm gonna tell you 
you, you probably aren't going to use that much. And what I will say is, um, if you use a trigger handler framework, you basically never have to use them, or you really shouldn't use them. And in my personal opinion, you should only use these within a trigger handler framework. Again, we're going to go over that later. But I just want to go over what these variables are and how you might use them and, you know, all that kind of stuff. So when you are in a trigger, you have a bunch of variables that are only relevant within the running context of the trigger itself, right? So we can we can figure out, you know, is the trigger executing? Um, are we doing an insert call? Are we doing an update call? Is it a delete? Are we in a before statement of a trigger? Are we in an after statement? Um, undelete, blah, blah, blah. And then we have these other variables that are uh, you would see more commonly used. Uh, actually, is insert, update, is delete. All these things are uh, relatively commonly used too. Um, but trigger.new gives you the list of the new records that your trigger is operating on. Uh, and we'll see that in just a minute. Then we also have new map, which gives you a map of the uh, objects uh, by their IDs that you are currently operating on. You also have access to the old records in the map of the old records as well. And what, uh, you know, these are the records prior to you actually making that update. So you can see you know, what has changed between the start of your trigger, uh, you know, before your insert of your record or your update of your record, and, you know, what hasn't. Um, you can also figure out the operation type uh, and the size of the records that your trigger is um, operating on. So, lots of good stuff to know about. Again, this will be linked in the description of the video as well. But let's figure out how we might use those, right? So we know that we have this um, trigger dot is uh, before. And so we could say, you know, if the trigger is in the before context, then let's run just this debug, this ran yay. And then we could say if the trigger dot is after, then we could run the cool method. And maybe in the cool method, we'll, we'll change this and we'll say, you know, I don't know, for contact cont um, trigger dot new system dot debug cont. This is the contact that was updated like so, right? So now we kind of have this separation in here that says, you know, if a trigger is in its before context, and this could be before update, it could also be before insert, it could be before delete, before whatever, um, then we need to run this or, you know, output this system debug. If it's in an after statement, uh, or an after execution, after update, after insert, after delete, uh, after undelete, then let's run the cool method like we have here. So let's see this in action and, uh, you know, see how useful it can be. So we will again just come back over here to Salesforce, uh, update my record, save it and do nothing, um, and then we will check this out. And we'll see that we only got one this time. We only got one of this ran, yay. And then uh, we also got only one of, this is the contact that was updated, and um, you know we got all of our contact information in there. So that is uh, pretty cool and pretty useful. Let's bring the code back up. Now you can also, of course, do even more here and you could say trigger dot is um, well is update 
So you'd only want it to do it on before a before update statement, essentially. So it would only run on before update. And um, same thing down here. You could also say and uh, trigger dot is I don't know is insert in this um, situation. So this would only run on after insert at this point. So you get more and more granular with it, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So now if I ran this again, right? Uh, this debug would run, but my cool method here that output my contact would not run. Um, so that's kind of why these uh, trigger context variables are useful. Um, the other thing that's super useful with these trigger context variables is what we talked about before, which was determining whether or not something had actually changed. Now, we have trigger.new and trigger.old, and trigger.new map and trigger.old map. And the old map has the old values of your records before somebody updated them, and the new has the new values of your records after somebody updated them. And you might be thinking, if you've never written a trigger before, well, why do I care to check? Who cares? I just want it to update. I want it to do whatever actions I want it to do. But there's this whole concept of bulkification and triggers and what happens is if you don't figure out how to narrow down the records that you want to update and really be very selective about you know what to do when and all that kind of stuff uh, this can get pretty complicated actually then then you know um, what you're going to end up with is a really really inefficient trigger and there are times when your trigger has to update hundreds or maybe in some cases thousands of records and the slower your trigger is uh, the more likely you are to hit limits uh, you know Salesforce limits and have problems with your code so um, trigger.new and trigger.old should almost always be used in update context um, so that you can figure out what you actually you know which records you actually need to manipulate or would like to manipulate or whatever else so that you can really narrow down your records as much as you can um, obviously trigger dot um, old doesn't exist for inserts because there is no old record right um, so you wouldn't have to worry about that there. If it's an insert, you're just going to be working with trigger.new because these are all brand new records, right? They didn't previously exist. But for updates, for instance, um, maybe I want to check something before I actually make an update. Or I want to check that something has been changed. So maybe I could say like uh, the following. Um, we could create a contact and we could call it the old contact we could set it equal to trigger dot old map dot get um, the new contacts ID if you don't know how to use maps um, I do have a video about maps and I will link it in the description I'm not gonna go over maps and the concepts of them and how they work in this but effectively what I'm doing here is I'm saying you know I'm looping through this list of contacts and I want to grab a contact uh, from my old map that matches the one in this new one. And I'm doing that with the ID. Uh, if you don't know what loops are either, for loops, I've got a video for that as well. You can go check it out and uh, become more familiar with this concept. Okay, and maybe I want to check, you know, that the birth date is different or something. So I can say contact dot uh, birth date is not equal to old contact dot birth date and in the instance that this is true then I want this debug to be printed or maybe I wanted something on my contact to be actually let's make this more realistic then I'll say if this is true then my contacts last name should equal uh, taco bell boy yeah okay so we will uh, change this to say is update I'm actually going to change this one to say is insert just to show you how this works. And uh, 
we're gonna run this give it a shot see what happens all right and uh, we are going to update my birthday to November 1st 1999 and save it and that ran pretty quick and uh, you know I did this on after update and uh, that's uh, silly but it's a good thing I did because it's a good thing to um, talk about <laughs> that's actually the next thing I was gonna go over so you no know, maybe my brain was just right there uh, with me so I have attempted to update this context or sorry update this contact in an after insert um, or sorry after update call in after calls you cannot update the contact, the, the, the records that your um, trigger is operating on currently. So in an after context, you don't have the right to, um, you know, update the contact that is already going through the trigger. And that's because, uh, like we talked about way back in the beginning here, the record at this point when we're running an after trigger has already been recorded to the database though it hasn't been committed yet. So it's in what's called a read-only mode, which means that you don't have the rights to edit it at this point. You would have needed to do that in the before statement of a trigger. So if you're, you ever have a need to actually alter the fields of the records that you are currently having go through the trigger that are currently being updated, then you need to make sure that that happens on a before and not an after. <clears throat> if you do it in the after, it's going to give you that error that we just saw. Let me read it to you a little better. Uh, well, record is read only, right? It's complaining that I've updated this record. Um, again, because it's in the after context and it's already been um, saved to the database, just not permanently committed to the database or, you know. Maybe permanently isn't a good word for that. All right, so we've updated this. So now the cool method uh, that's going to update us to Taco Bell Boy will run on the before, and we should be good to go. Let's bring up the right stuff, though, and get to it. All right, so let's go to November 1st again here and save it. And you can see it actually updated that time. And we've got a success statement. And if we go down, <clears throat> oh, there would be no debugs. So if we click debug, you can see, uh, which is important, that um, this did not run because it was not an after insert. It was an after update. So there was no, um, this ran, yay, anything like that. But what we should see is our contact's last name was updated, updated Taco Bell Boy. So let's... Um, go hopefully check that out of course I only have the first name up here but oh up here we've got it Jambet Taco Bell boy <laughs> there we go um, and um, yeah so now you can kind of get uh, you know a brief overview of how these trigger context variables work when you might use them um, why they're useful and it all kind of comes down to this whole concept of making sure that you only run things in your trigger when you should run them when it's absolutely necessary to run them because you never want to run something in your trigger when you don't need it to run because when you get these triggers and you make them you you know they can get pretty big um, it will slow down your execution, especially if everything is running and you're not super selective with absolutely everything you do. Um, it is super important to understand that you, you need to know and you need to be specific in your code. This should only run in a trigger in this specific instance. And that's exactly what these trigger variables are for, setting you up so that this code will only run in this particular instance right and um, 
trigger dot new map and trigger dot or sorry trigger dot new and trigger dot new map and trigger dot old and trigger dot old map are there specifically for that as well to really really hone in on when I should have something change. All right, we've learned a lot about triggers already, but there's two additional quick things that I want to go over because I think they're important and they're things that, um, you know, unfortunately a lot of people don't know about or don't know exist and they're very useful. So the first is that in trigger operations, you have the ability to essentially create your own validation rules. So you can actually do validation rules in triggers if you'd like to. So for instance, if I wanted, you know, if I changed the birthday and I wanted a, uh, you know, an error to pop up for me, then I can do that. And the way that I would do that is I can say contact .add error, and I can say, you know, you can't change the, uh, well, you know, got to escape things. You can't change the birthday. Sorry, bro. Like so. And um, this is pretty cool. So you can, uh, you know, do this add error to essentially throw your own validations, uh, validation rules in your trigger. And what this will end up doing is it's going to show you, uh, you know, if we go back to our Salesforce org and go to a contact and, um, you know, we update this contact's birthday, for instance, to that. It should, as long as things saved, which they may or may not have saved. Let me do this on a regular detail page, though. Let me make sure it's saved. It appears to have saved. If I change the birthday and save it, it should say, okay, good, it did. You can't change this birthday. Sorry, bro. Right, so you've you've thrown your own validation uh, error, and there are um, several overrides to this method, I believe, um, where you can uh, tell it what field you'd like it to show up on, so you can have it, you know, actually show up specifically on a, a field, just like in a validation rule, um, and a handful of other things. So, uh, pretty cool. It's uh, a very useful thing that uh, will allow you to essentially put your own custom validations and triggers if you'd like to. Super useful. The second thing before I get into a bunch of other stuff um, is that we haven't gone over the fact that, <laughs> unfortunately to this point, we haven't gone over the fact that when you create triggers, you should only create one trigger per object and only one. Uh, lots of orgs have, unfortunately, multiple triggers for a single object. So instead of just having this one contact trigger, that, like I have in this org, maybe there's five contact triggers. Uh, that's, a, that's a really, really, really bad idea. And the reason that it's a bad idea is because, uh, well, there is no order to the way that these triggers will fire. So if you have one contact trigger that does one thing, another contact trigger that does another, there's no way to guarantee that contact trigger A fires before contact trigger B. And that can be really dangerous and uh, difficult to deal with. So always make sure if you're gonna make a trigger, one trigger in, uh, you know, on, on one object. No more than that. Otherwise, you get yourself into a not so fantastic situation. All right. Um, yeah, wanted to go over those real quick. Now let's go over some uh, bulkification topics. All right. So we've gone over, you know, how to write a trigger uh, in its simplest form. We've gone over these trigger variables, why they exist, when you should use them, um, and, you know, how they help you make sure that your trigger is as lean or as you know, selective uh, with its processes as it can be. Now there's two more things uh, that we should really go over. And that's when should you use a trigger, um, you know, for an update or something else like an asynchronous process. 
The other thing is bulkification and triggers. Um, so let's go over both of those things. We will start with when should you use, uh, you know, when should you actually do your updates and your trigger, and when should you maybe do them other places, like in a controller or, or you know, some custom code in a controller, or potentially in your trigger, send it out to an asynchronous process to get things done. Um, so let's talk about that. Uh, you basically want a trigger to run and do its job within it if it's imperative that the person, uh, you know, if, if it's really, really important that the person who is, you know, saving the record or updating the record, that when that user does that, that they are instantly shown an update. Like you, they want it real time, the exact second that they they save a record, uh, they want that update to be present right in front of them. That's when you would use a trigger, right? You would use a trigger when you need a user to see it right in front of them immediately, and this needs to this operation needs to happen on you know the vast majority of records that go through this process, right? Um, times where you wouldn't put something, you know, I guess in a trigger to be automatically done are in situations where you're updating a record and it's very, very specific to a very, very specific uh, situation and you want to put it in a controller because, you know, I don't know, it's best served there. If most of your records are going to go through this process, uh, go through a particular process, I wouldn't put it into, you know, an Apex controller or, or, you know, a service class. I don't want to get too complicated for people that don't know about service classes. But you might want to put that in a different place. If it very rarely happens or it's just unique to whatever special UI thing you've built, maybe it doesn't deserve to be placed in a trigger because it would just slow the trigger down for... A very very unique situation but if most of your records are gonna go through this process and require it then I wouldn't put it in a controller I'd put it in the trigger the second thing is right if you don't need um, your your user to be instantly gratified or instantly shown uh, the updates to whatever you're trying to update uh, because you've you know updated a record or created a record or something like that, then you probably shouldn't put it in a trigger. Um, instead, you should have the trigger call a queuable uh, or some other asynchronous code to do those updates in the background. So you might be thinking like, well, what scenario am I going to get myself in where that's relevant? But what you will see uh, more often than not, well, more often than you expect, is You'll update a contact, maybe, in your Salesforce uh, instance, and somebody wants you to go update five related records to that contact, right? I don't know what they are. Who knows? You could have five, 20, 30 related records to a contact that need to be updated just because your contact was updated. And in those instances, a lot of the times, you don't need to instantly show the user that that happened. And if you put all that in the context of your trigger, it would really, really slow your trigger down, which would not be great because there's no benefit to it, right? Instead, what you can do is if you have 30 or 50 records or even five records or one record that doesn't need to be instantly updated, as in right this second updated for the user, then push it out to an asynchronous process and let the asynchronous process handle that. And if you have absolutely no idea what asynchronous processes are, don't worry, I've got a video going over literally everything you could need to know about them, so you can check that out as well. But um, anytime you don't need the instant gratification of seeing something the moment that you save or update or delete or whatever a record, don't put it in the trigger. Right? I wouldn't suggest it anyway. Put it in 
an asynchronous process and let it handle it. And um, that way, your trigger operation is still super fast and people still get what they need. OK. So we got over those two scenarios. I get those questions a lot, so I figured I'd go over them real quick here because they're important to know. And I see that not being done a lot. Like I see people put things that should be in a trigger in controllers way too often. And I see people put, you know, things that should be in asynchronous transactions, transactions that can take place out in the future instead of instantly in triggers way too often too and that one can massively slow down triggers for no reason so um yeah super important stuff want to go over it now let's get into the big one bulkification of triggers this is a problem that far too many people get themselves into you have a trigger that you've written, and you've written it in the single use case of a user only updating one record, or maybe like five records or something. And your trigger is now, you know, needed to run on 500 records. Well, If you don't bulkify your trigger and you try to run it on 500 records, your trigger will die and your life will become miserable. <laughs> I'll just put it that way. So we're going to go over a couple things that are really important to understand when you're writing your triggers. Um, the first is if your trigger can't handle at least hundreds of records, your trigger is not good. Uh, you need to go think about how to rewrite it or fix it or do something to it to make it more efficient because every trigger should be able to handle at least a couple hundred records. Um, and we'll go over some popular bulkification uh, concepts here in just a minute. But just know this, triggers always must be capable of handling at least a couple hundred records. And if your trigger cannot handle that situation, chances are you've done something you shouldn't have done. Um, the second thing is that's really, really important to know about triggers is triggers chunk records in batches of 200, at least currently as of today. That actually was different a long time ago. But as of API version 21, I think, or something along those lines, triggers batch records in chunks of 200. Um, with the exception of asynchronous triggers, which we're not going to go over today, I do have a video over that if you really want to go into that realm. I wouldn't suggest it, but they do exist. Regular triggers, though, that we're talking about today, um, they chunk things in, in batches of 200. And what I mean by that is, Say, for instance, you were using the data loader and you were uploading 1,000 contacts or updating 1,000 contacts at the same time. Well, I have news for you. Updating 1,000 contacts is going to cause your trigger to fire five times in the exact same context. So what does that mean? That means that if I updated 1,000 records, you would, you know, and I, uh, I, you know, and it would, it was in the before statement, for instance. This before statement you would see run five times, despite the fact that you technically only did one operation. You know, you, you did your uh, thousand all at the same time, like you updated all one thousand at the exact same time. You didn't like batch it in chunks in the data loader. You you just really did, you know, set up a thousand, you tried to insert a thousand in one big, big chunk. Triggers don't care about it. They're gonna say, hey, you got a thousand records, I'm gonna chunk it in two hundred. And I'm gonna run myself five times. So um, that's really important to know. Because if your trigger is not ultra efficient, like really, really efficient then having it run five times will be like 
your system committing suicide or something. <laughs> it's going to die uh, if, if you're not really careful <clears throat> and you don't really optimize these to the best of your ability. Because remember, this is not the only thing that runs in the context of um, you know, an update or whatever. There's all those other things. Flows, workflows, whatever else, if you put them in there. Um, so that leads to the next situation in bulkification. So we now know you insert 1,000 records. The trigger batches them in 200 and you go through, uh, you know, 200 records at a time, despite the fact you inserted them all at one, in one go. Now, as I talked about earlier, <clears throat> when we were going over order of execution, all of this stuff runs, all of it, no matter what. And, you know, <clears throat> I haven't benchmarked every single use case or every single scenario, but if you use, it seems, uh, you know, based on what I have benchmarked, it seems if you run a record triggered flow and a before trigger and an after trigger and assignment rules and auto response rules and workflow rules and um, validation rules and all this other stuff, things get slower and slower and slower and slower. And it's true, they do. But the more that you can consolidate into one automation tool, like if you consolidated your record triggered flows just into triggers, or, and you put your validation rules just into your trigger as well, the faster that things typically go. So in my opinion, for the vast majority of things, you should pick one automation tool and only one. If you want to use flows, use flows. If you want to use triggers, use triggers. If you want to use workflow rules or process builders, be my guest, but I wouldn't do that. <clears throat> to the best of your ability, I would keep as many of them as you can in a single, um, you know, type of uh, opera, you know, you know, keep, keep them all in triggers if you're going to put them in triggers. Keep them all in what other, whatever other process if you want to put them in those. Um, but the more that you can consolidate that, the faster things seem to run. Why that is, I'm not exactly sure. I'm sure it has to do with the code behind the scenes. But the more of these you use and the more of them that get executed in the same context, the slower and the slower, slower and slower and slower things seem to get. So if you're going to use triggers, maybe consider putting your validation rule in your trigger instead of in a validation rule. Um, and if you have flows with your triggers, I would just simply say don't do that. Um, that's going to help you a lot with your bulkification. And you know we can see that. And I will show you that actually really quick here. If, say for instance, I'm on my contact and I wanted to just create some really simple validation rule. <clears throat> validation rule, and we'll just say, I don't know. Cool validation, because apparently everything is cool, I guess, maybe. And um, we'll say, I don't know. Nah, that's going to be, we'll just say if, last name or first name is not equal to high, then output um, true, or sorry, false. Otherwise, um, fail this validation, do it true. And say, your name can't be high. Please change it. We'll save this. 
And uh, let's just run this and see what happens. I will first pull up the dev console and make sure it's still um, living its life. And it is, so that's good. And we are going to update this again. And we'll change this to DAS or something. And save it. And uh, we can take a look and see the log panels. Uh, where are you? Execution overview. And you can see that in the context of this one transaction, right, we've got our, um, <clears throat> con uh, sorry, our before trigger, our validation, and our after trigger, just like it said in the order of executions, right? Um, and we can see, you know, the validation didn't take us that long. It took us like 0.66 seconds, something like that. But let's just attempt to put it into uh, 0 0.6, 0 0.66 milliseconds, less than a single millisecond. It's a very simple validation. But let's just try and put it in the trigger and see if anything changes. Uh, you know, it's probably not going to be significant because this is simple. But if we put this into our trigger that we wrote and say something along the lines of public static void and validate data like so. And we said if, or sorry, for contact cont trigger dot new. Um, if trigger, oops, if cont dot first name equals equals hi cont dot add error, you uh, can't can't have the first name of hi. Please change it. Right? Like so. Then uh, we will call this method up here, validate data, and save it. What we'll see is, more than likely, um, this will get marginally faster. So. We're at 104, well, basically basically 105 milliseconds right now. We'll run this again and see what we get. That has saved, so that's good. Let's just change this to that. Save it. View log panels, execution overview. Oh, I left the validation on. Hang on, let me go. <laughs> let me go turn on my validation rule. That doesn't really help me. And uh, now we will do this one more time. Like so. And we can see this time it took 96 milliseconds. So this is just a small. Uh, you know, a small thing uh, in in here, right? But you know, as you can see, this took what almost almost ten milliseconds shorter just by putting that in the trigger instead of in into a validation rule. And what you can see is that seems to over time make things like take more and more and more and more time. So the more of these, you know different automation processes that you put into the mix, the slower things tend to execute. And it seems really small at first, but as you go up and up and up and up with all the things, um, it can really get crazy. So one of the things that is really, uh, I think, important when it comes to bulkification is this concept of using a single automation process to the best of your ability um, to, to, to do things. Um, you know, and some people will uh, maybe argue that uh, you know, Salesforce. Every single time you do an operation, you you know, things could go slower or faster. So I'm just going to do this one more time just to prove that it's always going to be a little bit faster. If we do view log panels, go to timeline, 
We can see it got even slower that time, or sorry, even faster that time. So it's, it's always gonna be a little bit faster and you can benchmark this yourself, but using one automation process basically always makes it faster. Um, even though you can see it changed a little, you know, it changed three milliseconds. Now we're, now we're super fast, right? And the more that you consolidate these processes, the faster and faster that it gets and the more bulkified your transactions can be. So that's super important uh, that you understand that. The other thing is it's under, under uh, you know, super important that you understand how the trigger chunks things, uh, really how the automation processes chunk things in general. 200, even if you inserted 1,000 at the same time, it's gonna run that stuff five times in a row. And, you know, we already kind of went over it just a little while back, but it's also super important, very, 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 very important in your triggers to be ultra selective with everything that you do uh, to your records, you know? When should it be updated? Exactly when and only when should it be updated? All that kind of stuff. The other thing is just like the basic stuff when you're writing really quite frankly any code but especially in a trigger um, you don't want to do things you know inefficiently uh, i could have instead of using this old map for instance done two for loops really figure out how to get comfortable with maps if you're not again i have a video over them if you're not comfortable with maps you need to be for triggers. You don't want a bunch of for loops and for loops and for loops. If you don't understand the concept of what's called um, what big O notation, uh, the more for loops you have, the slower things go. The more nested for loops you have, the slower things go. And there's a lot more to that as well. I'm not going to go over all that. If you want some information about that, go check out Brooke Johnson's channel. Brooke Johnson. He's, he's got some good stuff over that. But I'm not going to go into that. Um, don't do inner for loops, use maps. The other thing is, uh, you know, use asynchronous processes whenever you can. Never ever, and I'm talking like ever in a trigger, do something like trigger.new0, for instance, dot first name. Don't do that. You, you, you Just don't. You might think it's okay right now, but just operating on a single element in your new list is is going to just ruin your life um, eventually maybe not today maybe not tomorrow but eventually it's going to ruin your life the other thing is don't do SQL queries within a loop right don't do DML statements on an individual uh, element so you know don't write something like list contact con, con list equals uh, sorry select ID from contact where ID in trigger dot new or something along those lines <clears throat> don't write these queries inside of a for loop in a trigger it will absolutely fail at some point and it will be horrible, right? This is, you never really want to do this anywhere in Salesforce, but you especially don't want to do it within a trigger. Uh, the other thing is, you know, maybe you're rotating through these contacts, you're looping through these contacts and you want to update them or insert them or something. And you want to say update contact. Number one, you can't actually even do this because these contacts are already being updated in the context of this trigger. So don't ever try this, it's not gonna work. If you wanna update a contact that's already in, or a record that's already in a trigger, do it in the before context like we already talked about. But say you're operating on other records and you wanted to update them. Don't update one at a time in a for loop, right? That's also basically trigger suicide. It's not gonna end well for you. I promise, I promise. <laughs> <laughs> don't do it instead what you do is you would set up something like list um, contact updated con whoa, updated contacts equals new list contact like so and um, 
for each one you say updated contact dot add you need to add your contact and then when you're down here you just say update updated contacts so you'd update the whole list at once which means that you'd only have one DML operation instead of potentially hundreds and if you didn't know there's lots of limits around DML operations I believe the limit is 150 per transaction so if you did that within a loop um, instead of you know outside of the loop in one list you get yourself into a tricky situation especially in bulk operations so um, yeah <clears throat> no SOQLs in for loops no individual contact or sorry record updates in for loops no things that you know will obviously get you into system limitations don't don't do that um, and don't try to operate on just a single record in a list that is gonna really not, not work out for you all right so before we move on to the really really cool stuff like trigger handlers domain classes etc let's just recap the uh, concept of trigger bulkification one last time because there's a lot of stuff in there and I want to make sure that we all remember it so uh, first things first uh, don't do any of the, the silly stuff they, the first time around you're probably gonna get yourself into I certainly did the first time I did did, did software development um, and especially in Salesforce but don't do things like so cool in for loops DML statements in for loops using a single uh, record uh, you know in your just looking at one record at a time in your uh, trigger context like like this you know like I mentioned before um, don't do those things because you're limiting you're limiting what you can do in in your trigger right so that, that's the simple stuff stay away from anything that can run you into a limit those are the big ones right but there are other there are others as well um, <clears throat> the second thing is if something doesn't need to happen immediately in a trigger don't do it in the trigger push it out to an asynchronous process right push it out there get it out of the way don't do it in your trigger don't slow it down don't waste your time um, again you don't know what an asynchronous process is I've got a video for it check it out um, third thing is make sure you only do operations when you need to do them as long as you don't do operations when you don't need to do them your trigger will be you know relatively efficient as efficient as it can be in that particular situation so definitely take the time to be selective there are these trigger context variables for that reason so make use of them right um, understand how to use maps again you don't know how to use maps I got a video for it so figure it out they, they will speed up your operation times considerably so definitely 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 do that um, and the last thing to the best of your ability consolidate all of your automation process into one type of automation process whether that's a trigger a flow validation rules whatever keep them all in the same place as we saw through that benchmarking demonstration that I did that was very simple even with a very simple thing we saved you know upwards of almost 10 percent of our time by uh, well close to 10 percent of our time by consolidating automation processes and I promise you you'll see the same thing on a much grander scale the more that you you know consolidate you know if you have a ton of stuff and you consolidate it you'll see a huge reduction in time uh, as long as you also are efficient in your trigger in the code that you write right <laughs> so um, yeah really important stuff um, and uh, you know don't overlook it these are all things that you really need to take into consideration when you're writing triggers anywhere really quite frankly um, but especially in Salesforce um, all right I think I think I think <laughs> we've gone over all of the important introductory type concepts 
for triggers. We've gone over what a trigger is, trigger context variables, how triggers differ from apex classes, uh, bulkification of triggers, when to use a trigger instead of a flow, when to put code in triggers as opposed to controllers and, and um, uh, asynchronous processes. We've gone over a lot of stuff. So hopefully you have a good general understanding of what all these, you know, all uh, what you can do in a trigger at a base level. Now, the next thing that we're going to go over are trigger handler frameworks. What they are, why they're awesome, and why you should always use them instead of writing your code directly in a trigger like so. And after we go over trigger handler frameworks, we'll go over the even cooler concept of domain classes and how you can use those to massively separate out your applications in really, really awesome ways. So let's get to it. OK, so let's go over these trigger handlers. Uh, we're going to go over, again, what they are, why they're useful, and I'm going to go over uh, a few of my favorite trigger handler frameworks so you don't have to write your own because that's a lot of work. Um, and there's already great ones in existence. And uh, yeah, and then we'll just do a couple of simple, uh, you know, a simple example together. So, all right. What is a trigger handler? And more importantly, why would you care to ever be bothered by one? Well, as we saw, you know, uh, right at the beginning, saw, saw, right at the beginning of this video, um, or close to the beginning of this video, triggers are unique. Unlike classes, you cannot call them to reuse the code within them. And that's not typically ideal, because a lot of the stuff that you write in a trigger, you actually might have good use cases for outside of that trigger. You know, you might, re you might not realize it right now, but you probably will get into that situation. And more importantly, you can't call these specific methods to say unit test them or you know test them individually or anything like that in a test class, which is pretty frustrating. So getting good coverage in a trigger is often not possible, or you know, it's a real pain, if nothing else. Um, especially when you get into unit testing, which is a really advanced concept uh, for 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 many of you um, I do have a, several videos over unit testing so if you really you're really curious about that and definitely check them out but trigger handlers allow us to take all of this logic that we wrote in this trigger and put it in a regular old apex class that will uh, then be easily testable you could call it from another place uh, if you wanted to and some other apex code somewhere if you wanted to and uh, it's so it's just it's just really useful in the sense that you can test it better and in the sense that you can reuse your code if you'd like to right um, so this is why people say don't ever write anything in a trigger because you know it's tough to test and it's impossible to reuse outside of the trigger which is not ideal so in come trigger handlers and trigger handler frameworks and I just have a really simple example of a trigger uh, uh, that uses a trigger handler and a trigger handler framework. And uh, you can see in this instance, we have basically no code in our trigger. So I have a case trigger that operates on before insert. And all I have is the statement that effectively runs my trigger handler. Um, and we can see this case trigger handler here, over here. And uh, it'll have these methods that you can override, like before insert, and and uh, there will be like before update, after insert, after update, etc. And uh, <clears throat> we can, uh, you know, take a look at this trigger handler, which again you don't really need to know too much about. But this trigger handler framework, this code, this run method is where that, or this is where that run method exists that you saw here. And uh, it does all of the hard work for us. You know, if it's before insert, then run the before insert method, before update, run before update, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So it does all the tough work for you. Um, if you want to look at how these trigger handler frameworks work, I'm not going to go over it in this video. 
But spoiler alert, uh, they they work uh, by using the same kind of uh, things that we did here, where you know we say if triggers before and is update, then then do this and do that and blah blah blah. Now they're a lot more complicated than that. I don't wanna don't wanna you know <laughs> uh, make it that simple. But that's more or less what is leveraged to make these trigger handler frameworks work. Um, and again, as you can see, this trigger handler is now a class. And you could theoretically call this method from outside of this class if you wanted to and reuse this code. And it's much easier to test. And our trigger <coughs> basically has nothing in it, right? Aside from the call to here. So I'm restating a few things, but I really want to kind of uh, highlight these points. Now, um, I'm going to go over three of the trigger handler frameworks that I believe personally are the three best ones and who I believe should use each of them. Um, <clears throat> and um, yeah, I'm sure people will have different opinions than myself, and that's perfectly fine. And I would love to actually hear about them. So if you have any other suggestions for trigger handlers, aside from the ones I'm about to show you, then definitely uh, put them out there. So, OK. We have three very popular uh, trigger frameworks that I'm going to go over. Uh, the first one is a trigger framework written by Kevin O'Hara, and one that is constantly, uh, you know, you'll find it in trailheads being suggested to you by Salesforce. So it's a very popular trigger framework. It's the one that I was actually showing you back here. This guy, this is all it is. This one 240 line class, that's all it is. Um, <clears throat> it's a very simple framework. And, um, and that's actually great for most use cases. I would say the vast majority of orgs or a good portion of orgs uh, would only ever need this framework for their uh, triggers. So um, unless you're a really large org or you're a really compl complex org or you're an org that has lots of apps in it um, that need to kind of have their own unique siloed places uh, <laughs> in the world, then this trigger framework is one of the best that there is. It's very simple. It's very easy to use. It's very easy to extend. And uh, I would personally suggest it, especially to anybody that's just getting into trigger handlers uh, and, and have not gotten super comfortable with them yet. <clears throat> this is a great place to start. And it's going to, at the very least, make your triggers considerably better. So if you have a smaller org um, and not one that's super complex or too complex, this is where I would start. And I would uh, you know, suggest it for a good deal of places. Now, that said, it can't do everything that other, place, uh, other frameworks can do. Um, and we'll see that in just a second. But it can do quite a bit. Um, and uh, you know, I'd start here, unless you have a, a monster org, or, or at least a decent size org. Start here and move on up. Anyway. This is, a, this is one of the best, best frameworks uh, in existence, in my opinion. It's simple. It's great. It makes it easy for new people to get into trigger frameworks and trigger handlers. So definitely check it out. It'll be in a link in the description for sure. So uh, you'll be able to check it out there as well. OK, the next one is a, the trigger, uh, sorry, Apex Trigger Actions Framework, which was made by Mitch Spano or Spano. I actually don't know. Uh, sorry, Mitch. Um, it's a great framework, and it extends uh, your capabilities quite a bit from this one. This one is pretty simple. Uh, Mitch's is quite a bit uh, more complicated. But um, it has a lot that you can do. And basically, what it ends up being is this uh, what's referred to as metadata-driven um, trigger, essentially, uh, or metadata-driven trigger handlers. And it's pretty cool because you can um, really control quite a bit of it through custom metadata and just setting up rules yourself in here. And you can turn on and off different portions of your trigger in different situations, which is really quite uh, useful. Um, so if you have a bigger org 
and you want a more declarative way to uh, manage your trigger and to turn portions of your trigger on and off this is an excellent framework for this you can even do it and uh, use it in flows if you wanted to so absolutely worth checking out for medium to large size orgs I would say smaller size orgs this is way too much like way too much so don't don't uh, don't do it I mean you can if you wanted to but it's probably not worth your time um, but definitely medium to large size orgs I will go more of this um, you know metadata driven trigger action framework that we've got going on here uh, that, that Mitch uh, so kindly put together for us all, all and uh, released for free um, again as you can see its uh, help documentation is quite a bit uh, more challenging and, and there's much more to read here so yeah the last one that I would like to suggest uh, which is much much more than a trigger framework is my personal favorite and some people will definitely not like me for saying it but I I'm okay with that is the apex common framework um, it is absolutely excellent um, as you can see even you know it's the more most uh, forked most starred uh, it has the most contributors it is and it's just an incredible framework and it gives you um, not only a great trigger framework that also uh, can <clears throat> can uh, compete with um, Mitch's framework that he's put together here but uh, can do quite a bit more as we'll go over when we see domain uh, uh, the domain logic that I'm going to talk to you about or domain classes that I'm going to talk to you about in the in a bit so um, Apex Common is a big thing and I actually have a 17 part tutorial series over the Apex Common library and let me tell you uh, for large orgs um, and uh, you know uh, manage packages uh, this is you know, we should be thankful it exists uh, the team that put this together uh, forever ago at financial force and the team that currently updates it since it's not owned by financial force anymore rather the public or uh, o open source salesforce I think um, is uh, you know we're lucky they exist we're lucky they care enough to keep it updated um, and it's pretty pretty excellent so uh, if uh, we're gonna go over this a little bit when we get into domains but if you want to learn how to use this I got a huge tutorial I have a huge wiki over it definitely check it out for large orgs this will unlock um, some amazing things that you can do uh, architecturally in you know an application architecture coding architecture all that kind of stuff so these are my three again uh, I would only use Apex Common for larger orgs, like really, really big orgs. Um, trigger Actions Framework could be used for big orgs uh, or medium-sized orgs. If you don't want to get into Apex Common, you don't feel comfortable, you don't want to learn all that stuff, I totally understand. It's a lot to take in. Um, so Mitch's framework uh, comes in really well here for those that aren't interested in, in dealing with you know everything that comes with Apex Common and learning everything there. Um, and the trigger action framework, or sorry, the trigger framework that Kevin O'Hare wrote is again excellent for most orgs that are um, small to medium. So there you go. Those are my three recommendations. Uh, check them out. They'll all be in links in the description. And um, yeah, it's uh, it's great. So um, I'm not going to show you how to use each one of these. And I'm saying that because I already have tutorials on them. So if you wanna know how to use Kevin O'Hara's framework, check out the uh, you know link in the description. It'll be there. I've got a whole tutorial on it. Don't worry about it. I don't have one for Mitch's trigger action framework, so I apologize. Uh, if you wanna go check that out, uh, there are there's tons of documentation on it. There might even be videos on it. I haven't looked. Uh, someday I'll probably make one, but I'm not gonna make one a day. And um, if you want to know how to use the uh, Apex Common Framework for uh, triggers, don't worry. I got you covered, plus a bunch more. So definitely check that out, too. 
uh, worth your time. I promise it will make uh, your coding life uh, just a breeze after you figure it all out and start using it where you, you'd want to use it. All right, so trigger frameworks. We figured out why we might use them. Uh, we figured out, you know, the three that, that I'd recommend um, and, uh, you know, how they change things for triggers, all that kind of stuff. The um, next thing that we should talk about is domains. And then I'm going to go over very briefly some things that you should just make sure that you add to your triggers one way or another, whether it's through a trigger handler as a domain or your own custom stuff. If you really want to go that route, I wouldn't recommend it, but it's up to you. Um, okay, so, so, <laughs> domain classes. Uh, what are they and how do they differ from a trigger handler? People are really confused about this because they are very similar things. And if you don't know what a domain class is, I have a video over what a domain is and, and you know how to implement a domain domain class. But let me just explain it a little more. Technically, you could make a trigger handler a domain, right? That's confusing, but they could, you know, you could just extend the functionality of a trigger handler into a domain. And technically speaking, that's basically what we do. So. I have um, an example here, maybe, I hope, <clears throat> of a domain class. And it's a little bit complicated. But basically, um, <clears throat> what a domain class does that a trigger handler doesn't just inherently do anyway is a domain does uh, consist of your you know, on before update, all your trigger handler type stuff, on before update, on after update, on uh, after insert, on blah, blah, blah. All that kind of stuff can be held within a domain class. But more importantly, it can have methods um, that are, you know, available to other places, right? And we already kind of talked about this, but uh, and technically a trigger handler could do this, so don't, it is, a, it is a little confusing, but we call it a domain because it effectively houses all of the actions or automations that you would take on that, sp that, are, that are unique, I suppose, to that specific object. So if you have Say, for instance, <clears throat> um, a very specific procedure for creating tasks, maybe, that is unique to the account object. You might put the account task creation or account object task creation in a domain class. If you have a really unique, you know, situation, uh, I suppose, or, or behavior that should that should happen for that specific object, the account, the contact, whatever it is you're making a domain class for, you would also always want to try to put that into the domain. Unlike a trigger handler, where you don't necessarily put that behavior into the trigger handler, into a method, um, in a domain, you would attempt to do that. So any, any kind of action that you might take that's unique to the account object you'd put that in a tri uh, in the uh, sorry the domain class in trigger handlers <clears throat> things that are called trigger handlers anyway you don't typically see that you'll just see you know what we see here like a before insert and after insert a you know after update etc cetera, etc cetera, these kind of methods <clears throat> that you would override and place in your trigger handler whereas the domain you would see that plus any behavior that is unique to an object. Uh, so any methods that are unique to that object. Um, that is the main difference. And uh, <clears throat> I got to drink water here. <laughs> I've been talking too much. But in my personal opinion, your code gets easier to deal with 
if you start using these domains because then you really know okay if I want to do something to an account if I want to make account specific logic I know exactly where to put it I know exactly where to find it um, otherwise things get kind of split out into these bunch of classes a whole bunch of different places who knows uh, where exactly and it gets harder and harder to keep up with so domains and trigger handlers not so different it's just that in a domain class you really try to not only house the trigger logic but how's that unique um, object behavior or those unique object methods within it as well which is very very useful in my personal opinion especially as your org grows and you have more and more people doing more and more things now another really uh, interesting thing you can do with domains and uh, I would assume to be fair you could also do this with uh, trigger handlers so uh, I do want to go over this concept though <clears throat> Lots of us uh, will end up working in an org that has multiple application teams. You have an application team for your service desk. You have an application team for your sales division. You have an application team for your marketing division. And all these different people want to do the different things on some of the more popular objects like accounts or contacts or um, cases or whatever, right? And there is a really uh, unique way that you can kind of silo this data. You can silo these applications, even in a trigger, which is awesome. Um, but I don't see many people talking about this architecture, and it's kind of unfortunate uh, because it really unlocks some potential that you otherwise wouldn't have, and it really speeds up the development in your org. So I'm going to go over this domain architecture that uh, you know I've uh, put together with you know not, not just my own brain but with help of other people that I've worked with and um, and show you how to use it because it allow you to silo all your applications into their own unique domains uh, or potentially their own unique trigger handlers and um, it's pretty cool so uh, yeah let's uh, figure out how to do that and then um, afterwards we're just gonna go over a handful of last things that I think we should go over and um, this long video will hopefully be at an end <laughs> we'll see so uh, let's figure it out all right so we're gonna figure out how in a trigger you can divide uh, you know your trigger into different application teams um, and again this is not something that came from just my own brain this is something that came from uh, someone uh, who had asked this question on the Apex Common uh, GitHub, and then uh, you know uh, myself and another developer I've worked with for a very long time, whose name is also Matt uh, Matt Hoffman, um, uh, put this together that allows you to to really split out your your logic for these different applications in a trigger, which is amazing. Because um, if you had no idea about this or you haven't got yourself into this, <clears throat> if you have a bunch of people working in the same class or the same trigger or the same whatever, um, and you have different you know, teams dealing with each thing, you go uh, and have team A update it, it could accidentally break something in for team B or team C or team D or whatever, application A, B, C, D, whatever. If they're all using the same trigger handler um, or the same domain class or whatever, well, you're in for some trouble potentially. You might have to ask team B and C and D if you can actually do this or if you do it without their consent uh, and without them testing their stuff, well then, um, you know, you might break something, get in a lot of trouble. Now, people could argue that uh, if you just had good tests, that none of that would be a problem, um, and you are correct. But this takes it to a whole new level and splits out your applications entirely, so you never have to worry about breaking other people's stuff. And you never have to worry about asking permission from application team B if application team A can update a trigger. Um, 
there's lots of other theoretical benefits, but we'll just stop there. And I'm going to show you how to create unique domains or unique trigger handlers, whatever you choose, for um, different applications. So let's figure this out. The first thing that we're going to do is create an Apex class, and we'll just call this the domain object Apex class, like so. And I'm going to zoom in. And we're going to have this Apex class, um, for my purposes, oops, uh, extend the FFlib S object domain class. Again, you may have absolutely no idea about the Apex Common Framework. In fact, most of you probably won't. Don't worry about it too much. Just worry about the concept that I'm trying to, to get through here. Uh, if you want to know about the, S, uh, the, the Apex Common Domain uh, setup, I've got videos over it. Go check it out. Um, it'll tell you absolutely everything you need to know. But this would be like a five hour long video if I went over all that. <laughs> I don't think anybody wants that, at least not today. <clears throat> And uh, I'm just going to put a couple things in here that are unique to the Apex Common Framework. Uh, again, not super important that you uh, know what these do, but I'm just going to put them in here uh, so that I can demo it with this pretty quick. These are required for the Apex Common Framework, but uh, you know, it's it's not necessary that you understand that. Um, and then I'm going to just drop two methods in here and and uh, explain how they work. And don't worry, this code will be available to you so you can check it out. So what I've basically uh, got in front of me here is a method within this domain object class that allows me to filter my, my uh, incoming records by their record types. Now you could also filter this by lots of other things. You could do it by name. You could do it by a specific field that gets filled out in a, a certain way. But right now, I'm just showing you how to do this with record types. But you can make this filter criteria anything. And I mean anything. So don't feel limited by record types. Um, and basically what this uh, does is it it's going to allow me to send in a list of record type names um, and um, have me be able to filter my trigger.new um, you know, out and, and figure out whether or not <clears throat> I actually have records that are relevant to my application or I don't. And that will help me determine whether or not I should run my application's trigger handler or domain class or not. So let's uh, figure out how to do this. So I'm going to save this and hopefully I have not forgotten anything. <clears throat> and I did not, thankfully. So that's great. And we are now going to go back to this accounts class that uses uh, the Apex Common Library. And we're going to have it extend the domain object. All right. And the next thing we are going to do is uh, actually, I did not make this a virtual class. So I need to do that real quick and save this. Um, I do have a video that goes over the concept of virtual classes. It's not super important that you understand that right now. But uh, to be able to extend a class like I have here, it needs to be virtual. So that's why I had to go do that. If you want more information about that, uh, check out my video on, um, oh, I don't know. I will link it. <laughs> I'm forgetting the name for it. I have so many videos. There's a hundred of them. I don't know. OK, so now that we have the domain object successfully saved um, and we have that set filter method in here, again, this code will be available to you in GitHub. Uh, you'll find that link in the description of the video. Um, we can now say super dot set filter and we can pass this uh, the parameters that it needs which is a set of strings like so we'll get the right record types here in a second and then we'll say um, we need to pass it trigger dot new and trigger dot old map in apex common uh, in that library that equates to records and existing records like so. 
I know it's a little bit frustrating. I, you know, it might be frustrating that I'm not going over all of the Apex Common Library right now. If I did, it would be such a long video. Uh, if you have any desire to know more about the Apex Common Library and the domain stuff there, I have a lot of videos over it. Um, but I just want to get this concept out there. Again, this is just I'm just trying to get the concept out there. Uh, don't in this part of the video. Don't think so much about the code. Think about what's what it's achieving. Um, but behind the scenes, records, existing records, um, this eventually equates to trigger.new and trigger.oldmap. So that's what I'm passing in here. And I'm going to just save this to make sure it saves. <clears throat> and uh, now I need to go find out what um, record types, if any, I even have on the account object. So let's go figure that out. Hopefully I've got one. Uh, you never know. I don't. I'm just going to make a new one real quick. I'm going to make a couple, actually, so that we can see this actually work. Uh, we'll call this um, cool, <laughs> cool record type. Because <laughs> why not? Let's just keep on, keep on going with that. And uh, we'll make that an available record type to everybody to keep this nice and simple. Um, we'll just give it the account layout and we'll make another record type. Someday. And we'll call this the non-cool record type. And uh, oh, I didn't activate this. Actually, I don't think I had to. And we'll save that. We'll also give it the account layout and hit save. I'm just going to double check that my first one was activated. Pretty sure it does by default because it was the first one I made. And I'm good. So I just need to get its developer name. And I'm going to pass that developer name in here. And now, basically, what I would end up uh, doing is uh, in this on before update, I would check to see, you know, if records uh, dot is empty, then I would just return. And I would, I would not do, you know, my on before update or potentially on after update. Every single time you'd want to check, uh, are my records empty? If they are, uh, let's return, right? You might also want to check and existing records dot is empty, like so. Okay, so then you'd return if they were both empty, and if not, you would continue on. And um, basically what this is going to do is it's going to come in here and uh, figure out, you know, am I operating on cool record type records? Uh, or am I not, right? And if I'm not, I don't want to do anything, so let's just not do anything. And um, we can even output something potentially that says, you know, system.debug, you had no matching records, or something along those lines. So. Let's um, uh, see what happens, right? And, uh, and then I'll show you exactly how you kind of extend this <laughs> in your trigger. All right, so let's go into uh, Salesforce and see if this works. Um, actually, but real quick, let me, <laughs> let me clean this up because I don't, I'm pretty sure I built this automation in a prior video uh, to intentionally fail. So I want to prevent that. I also want to, you know, prevent that from happening. I want to have a debug that tells me, you know, whether or not I did have matching records. Um, and uh, oh, there is one other thing I think I actually made a mistake on up here. <clears throat> um, okay. Yes, I I did. So I'm going to explain it real quick. Um, like I said earlier, records 
and existing records are essentially trigger.old or sorry tr trigger.new and trigger.old map if I send these in I'm going to be modifying them which is an illegal operation and a trigger so uh, I actually need to ne make new uh, variables here so this will be a list of contact or actually we're in the account trigger now account counts equals new list of account and then we also need a map ID account old account map equals new list oops <laughs> map ID account like so okay so um, in, at this point what we're gonna do is pass in this uh, new map um, or sorry this old account map in this uh, list of accounts and um, I'll explain how this works in just a second. I've, uh, <laughs> I've, you know, I didn't prepare enough for this. So let me uh, explain. I'll explain this in just a second. But let me go update this down here and say if accounts dot is empty and uh, old account map is empty instead of the others because it'll be full of stuff either way. So uh, let me save this. And let me go back to the domain object and just kind of explain a little bit how this works. So we can't use uh, trigger.new and trigger.old map. We can't filter those out because that's an illegal operation. We can't update, you know, what's in the trigger effectively, right? But what we can do is figure out what in the trigger is actually something that we care about for this application. And so effectively what we do is we loop through our um, list of records if there are any and we create a list of things that we do care about by figuring out you know does it contain this record type if it does then let's add it to that list that we care about and the same thing for the map and then we just return those and uh, we can work with those in the trigger instead um, you know or we can still work with records or um, you know existing records or trigger.new and trigger.old map as long as we make sure to filter them out based on what we get in return here all right <clears throat> so let's uh, save this and uh, move on over to Salesforce and in Salesforce we are just on a new account or on a, an account record that I've named new account that has a, a cool record type and we're just going to attempt to save it so I'm just updating it and saving it and uh, you know oh you know I need the dev console open I guess I could pull these up in IntelliJ but I think it's a little more challenging to read on the screen for you all in IntelliJ let's update this one more time and see what happened if anything so we can see we had matching records in this instance um, because this was of the record type cool record type but alternatively if I changed it to the non cool record type hit next and you know updated this to whatever and hit save and uh, looked at it now it should say I look at the right thing um, or this is empty and uh, it's not gonna give me uh, you had no matching records because my old old map would have had values in it <laughs> so in this in this instance that was uh, not the greatest thing to do I probably should only filter by um, accounts that is empty my old account of course had the rep record type of non cool record type right so that made it um, not quite work how I wanted to work let's just save this one more time and uh, hopefully we've got you had no matching records right okay so then so we've effectively uh, successfully filtered out our 
um, records based on you know the record type again you could filter this out by anything but you could by record type um, or I'm just showing you by record type now if you wanted this to be different for each application team you could have another uh, Apex class called uh, you know I don't know accounts I don't know marketing or something so this is another uh, domain class that we're calling accounts marketing and we'll just have it implement again the domain object and we're gonna do basically the exact same uh, setup here just grab the same stuff but we're gonna change it up so we've got accounts marketing we're gonna copy all this junk over here um, and it's going to complain about a handful of things that I need to change. And it's fine. Writing method. Uh, I needed to extend this, not implement it. Sorry. And um, I'm going to change this to non cool record type and make sure that I actually have the right record type name sure that I do Not a cool record type oh, I think I do I'm just gonna copy it make sure non cool record type good and uh, so now this uh, should run theoretically only when we have the non cool record type um, We'll update our on before update here uh, to make sure that we can differentiate between this trigger handler and the other one. We can go back to the accounts trigger, and what we're going to end up doing is copying this line of code, duplicating it, and say oops, accounts marketing dot class. And so our our trigger is now going to call two different um, domains or trigger handlers, whichever doesn't really matter. Um, and however, it's only going to do operations on the specific record type that we care about for that application, or the specific set of records that we care about for that application. And uh, you know, if if we don't have any of those records, then we're just going to return and not do anything, right? which is wonderful. So we've got that set up. It did deploy successfully. So now we've got both our accounts and our accounts marketing uh, classes. And so we've officially siloed our two different you know, applications in our org. Uh, if I could stop doing that, that would be great. And um, so now let's try to update this non cool record type and see what happens of course something broke here so that's cool work save it and uh, we should have a couple of successes here which we do and you can see uh, we had one that has you had no matching records which was from the accounts class and then this one says you had matching records non cool right in our non cool uh, in, our, in our marketing class here <clears throat> right so we did effectively filter and silo our our domains or our trigger handlers for each application and this is a great way to really silo off um, applications even in shared objects which is incredible uh, because it makes it so that you know, you don't have to have two different orgs a lot of the times and that you can still have things bulkified and simplified and all that kind of stuff. So the examples for this code uh, will again be in a GitHub repo that I link in this description. Um, if you want to know more about uh, the Apex Common Framework and actually using, you know, the same kind of setup that I have here, uh, then there are multiple videos on it that you can go check out. Um, but the 
goal of what I'm trying to show you here is a really useful way to silo applications that use the same objects if you need to, uh, which you will find in larger orgs with multiple applications, you, you, you probably will. So um, otherwise you'll get yourself into really tricky spots. So <clears throat> this is a really good way to do that by using that kind of filtering mechanism and uh, filtering out your records based on, you know, what's what's incoming. You know, whether that's based on record type or a specific field or a set of fields or, or, you know, whatever. I don't know. So, all right. We figured out how to filter things out to really give your uh, triggers these really awesome application silos, right? Which is cool. Um, we figured out what trigger handlers are. We figured out the difference between trigger handlers and domains, which is quite frankly not very much. They could both be the same thing. Um, we have figured out all the basic stuff about triggers, bulkification, blah, blah, blah. Now, there's one other thing I'd like to just briefly state that I don't think I stated anywhere else in this video, and that's that um, uh, just, just one small thing <clears throat> that you should have a way, ideally, to turn your trigger on and off. And it's even better if you can turn your trigger on and off for specific users uh, or whatever else. And I'm saying this because there's going to be a lot of times in your code where you don't want your, your trigger to operate. Like you're going to insert code into the database um, and you want to turn your trigger off. Right, you have a different, you know, maybe you have a controller or you have a service class or you just have some Apex class, whatever, that does an insert or an update or whatever. You really want the capability of turning your triggers on and off in those specific situations. Every single one of the, the um, trigger handler frameworks I've shown you has that built in to some extent. So you go with one of those trigger handler frameworks and you read the documentation, you can turn your triggers on and off whenever you want to. This is super important because a lot of times you do not need your triggers to run in a controller or you know in a, a UI that you've built or in a service class. So make sure that your trigger can be turned on and off. It's even more useful if your trigger can be turned on and off dynamically based on the user that's running the trigger at a current the, the current time. Um, I actually do have a video that I made a long time ago about setting that up using custom settings. It's still very relevant today. So if you want to check that out, definitely go check that out. I'll put a link to that in the description too. I'll probably link it up above. Uh, but but certainly um, check those things out. Um, make sure that your trigger has the ability to be turned on and off at will because you're going to want to do it a lot. And uh, I think I forgot to mention that uh, before. Um, yeah, I, I think, <laughs> I think that's probably it. Um, there's so much to say about triggers. There's so much you can do with triggers, and triggers are the failure point of far too many orgs. So that's why I wanted to go over all of this stuff, you know, when you should use async, when how you should use bulkification, or things you should look out for bulkification, trigger handler frameworks, what domain classes are, and more, you know, importantly, how you can theoretically silo your infra, your 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 triggers based on your application that's running, right? Which is pretty cool. Um, you know, if you guys want a more in-depth video on that trigger handler application siloing, I could certainly do that. I just wanted to give you the theoretical architectural concept there so that you go back and, and uh, try it yourself if you wanted to because it's pretty pretty useful. Um, all right, guys. I think that's it. I don't know how long this video is, but it feels like it's pretty damn long. So, <laughs> so uh, yeah. Hopefully there's a lot of useful information. Hopefully you guys uh, enjoy it. Um, hopefully you can use all these things in your org. Um, if you have any questions, let me know. I will do my best to answer them. Um, sometimes I'm pretty slow, but uh, you know, I'll, do, I'll do my best. Anyway, that's it for now, guys. 
I hope this was helpful, and I will see you next time. Thank you.